Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, begin. Um, this is a program on constitutional government, but we're going to hear a talk today on the discovery of entropy, if I pronounce it correctly. Uh, and our speaker is Adam Schulman, who's a tutor at St. John's College. He went to the uh, University of Chicago as an undergraduate with Stephanie Trick. Well, I guess well, somewhat before, and uh, then um, came to Harvard uh, for his uh, PhD in the history of science, uh, doing his uh, PhD dissertation on, the, uh, you need to tell me the, the title on the relationship. Quantum and Aristotelian physics. All right, quantum and Aristotelian physics. That covers uh, uh, a mouthful. And he was, he's been uh, on the staff of the President's Bioethics Commission and has worked on many of the issues uh, having to do uh, that the, that commission had to do with. And he's uh, uh, also written on uh, Jane Austen and some literary topics and uh, other, other things too. Um, uh, he's going to talk today. He's now, uh, at, right now he's uh, a visiting professor at MIT for the, this term and I think next year. And uh, right now he's going to uh, discuss, as I said, uh, the discovery of entropy. Adam Schulman. Thank you. My theme is entropy, how it was discovered, what it means, and what might be its wider and deeper implications. I think every educated human being ought to know something about entropy and the second law of thermodynamics, which says that the entropy of the universe or of any isolated part of it is always increasing. After all, aside from Darwin's idea of natural selection, the relentless increase of entropy is perhaps the discovery of modern science that has most profoundly colored our current view of human life and its status in nature as a whole. But if you are still not convinced that you need to drop everything and turn to the study of the works of Carnot, Kelvin, and Clausius, let me shamelessly cite a well-known, if middle-brow, authority in support. Here is C.P. Snow, the British physicist and novelist in his 1959 lecture on the two cultures. Quote, a good many times I have been present at gatherings of people who by the standards of the, the traditional culture are thought highly educated and who have with considerable gusto been expressing their incredulity at the illiteracy of scientists. Once or twice I have been provoked and have asked the company how many of them could describe the second law of thermodynamics. The response was cold. It was also negative. Yet I was asking something which is about the equivalent of, have you read a work of Shakespeare's? Parenthetically, it seems to me that most people find the first law of thermodynamics, which says that energy is always conserved, to be a more or less clear and reasonable principle with little of the mystery and obscurity surrounding entropy and the second law. That attitude may not be justified, and at the end of this talk, I will suggest that the opposite might be true. So this is a talk about entropy, but in a way, it is also about optimism and pessimism in modern thought, as I will show you shortly. The modern sci scientific notion of energy, or the capacity to do work, was first discovered and championed by Leibniz, the German mathematician and philosopher at the end of the 17th century. He used the Latin expression vis viva, or living force, but since about 1850, we have called it energy, derived from the Greek energeia, a word coined by Aristotle to mean something like activity. Leibniz was the first to propose the conservation of energy as a fundamental law of nature. Around the same time, Leibniz also expressed his view of the ultimate fate of the universe. In 1697, in an essay on the radical origin of things, he wrote, quote, we must recognize a certain perpetual and very free progress of the universe as a whole, so that it always <coughs> proceeds toward greater culture. And though it may be objected that if this were so, the world should have become a paradise long ago, there is an answer near at hand. Although many substances have already reached great perfection, Yet there always remain in the abyss of things parts that are still asleep, yet to be aroused and advanced into something greater and better, and in a word, to a better culture. Thus, progress never comes to an end. 
Such was the optimism that could accompany the discovery of energy conservation at the end of the 17th century. Now what Leibniz discovered was more precisely the interconvertibility of kinetic energy, or vis viva, the kind of energy that moving bodies possess, and potential energy, the kind that is stored up when a spring is compressed or a weight is elevated above the surface of the earth. It took another 50 years before modern science recognized that heat is yet a third form of energy, interconvertible under certain circumstances, uh, excuse me, uh, under certain circumstances with kinetic and potential energy. The leading figure in that discovery was the English brewer turned physicist James Joule, who like Leibniz was a confirmed optimist. Incidentally, I gather that Joule's brewery is still making its original pale ale along with a more dubious sounding beverage known as New Age Blonde. <laughs> Here is Joule commenting on the cosmic implications of the inclusion of heat in the conservation of energy. Behold then the wonderful arrangements of creation. Despite the apparent destruction of living force in almost all natural phenomena, we find that no waste or loss of living force has actually occurred. Thus it is that order is maintained in the universe. Nothing is deranged, nothing ever lost, but the entire machinery, complicated as it is, works smoothly and harmoniously. That is Joule in 1847, perhaps the high watermark of thermodynamic optimism. On April 24th, 1865, 10 days after the assassination of President Lincoln, a new word came into being. That word is entropy. It was the invention of another German scientist named Rudolf Clausius. He fashioned it from the ancient Greek word trope, meaning transformation. And as Clausius explained, he wanted to form a word that would be as similar as possible to the word energy. And he borrowed its root from the ancient <coughs> Greek in the hope that the word would be adopted unchanged in all modern languages. That hope has been abundantly realized. Like energy, entropy is the subject of a fundamental law of nature. But while energy can neither be created nor destroyed, entropy can only increase. As Clausius put it, summing up the two laws, the energy of the universe is constant, the entropy strives toward a maximum. Energy and entropy are the two basic notions of thermodynamics, the science of heat and its transformation into mechanical work. Energy, as I have indicated, may be defined as the capacity to do work. Because of the conservation of energy, it is not possible to do work without expending energy. This rules out the possibility of a so-called perpetual motion machine, that is, a machine that produces more energy than it consumes and thus can run indefinitely without further consumption of energy. Some would say that the intuition, or if you like, the axiom, that no such machine is possible is the logical ground for the first law of thermodynamics. Heat, as we have known since Joule, is also a form of energy, namely thermal energy. But thermal and mechanical energy differ in an important respect. It is always possible to transform mechanical energy into thermal energy, but it is not always possible to transform thermal energy into mechanical energy. For example, a spinning propeller immersed in water will heat the water up by friction, but the heat in the water cannot in general be transformed back into the motion of a propeller. In fact, most heat is not available to do mechanical work at all. The Atlantic Ocean, for example, is a vast reservoir of heat, but very little of that heat can be used to do work. The entropy of a system is, roughly speaking, an indication of how much heat is available to do mechanical work. If the entropy increases, that means there is less available work. And if, as Clausius stated, the entropy can never decrease, it follows that any heat that has by an increase of entropy become unavailable for work is irrecoverable. Applied to the universe as a whole, the law of the increase of entropy has a rather disturbing consequence, which was first noticed in 1852 by the British physicist William Thomson, later Lord Kelvin. Kelvin was the first to spell out the cosmic implications of the emerging science of thermodynamics. Here in part is the ominous conclusion of Kelvin's paper. There is at present in the material world a universal tendency to the dissipation of mechanical energy. Within a finite period of time past, the Earth must have been, 
and within a period of, within a finite period of time to come the earth must again be unfit for the habitation of man as at present constituted. <coughs> Thus we see within a few generations the sunny optimism of Leibniz and the age of reason giving way to the doom and gloom of the 19th century when scientists could prophesy with confidence the ultimate heat death of the universe. It seems to me that this cosmic pessimism which began to take root in the latter half of the 19th century has since become the dominant mood of the West. I am not, of course, insisting that the discovery of entropy bears primary responsibility for this development, but it must have helped. Here, for example, is Charles Darwin in 1876 commenting on, quote, the view now held by most physicists, namely that the sun with all the planets will in time grow too cold for life unless indeed some great body dashes into the sun and thus gives it fresh life. Darwin continues, quote, believing as I do that man in the distant future will be a far more perfect creature than he is now, it is an intolerable thought that he and all other sentient beings are doomed to complete annihilation after such long continued slow progress. Next here is the British logician and gadfly Bertrand Russell writing in 1903. That man is the product of causes which had no prevision of the end they were achieving, that his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms, that no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave, that all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system, and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. All these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. Only when within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. Probably a man who wrote too well, I guess. And finally, closer to home, here is the American theoretical physicist Steven Weinberg in the closing paragraphs of his 1977 book, The First Three Minutes. Quote, it is almost irreversible, excuse me, it is almost irresistible for humans to believe that we have some special relation to the universe, that human life is not just a more or less farcical outcome of a chain of accidents reaching back to the first three minutes, but that we were somehow built in from the beginning. It is very hard to realize that our world is just a tiny part of an overwhelmingly hostile universe. It is even harder to realize that this present universe has evolved from an unspeakably unfamiliar early condition and faces a future extinction of endless cold or intolerable heat. The more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. Weinberger adds some words of comfort. But if there is no solace in the fruits of our research, there is at least some consolation in the research itself. The effort to understand the universe is one of the very few things that lifts human life a little above the level of farce and gives it some of the grace of tragedy. It is partly in this spirit that I offer the following account of the discovery of entropy. By the end of this hour, I hope to have exhibited the difference between merely knowing by hearsay that, ent that the entropy of the universe is always increasing and understanding with some precision where that idea came from, what it really means, and what evidence it rests on. The remarkable story of its discovery spans the years 1824 to 1854, during which most of classical thermodynamics was created by three men, one French, one British, and one German. Part two is about Carnot. Our story begins in 1824, when a young French engineer named Sadie Carnot wrote a long essay entitled Reflections on the Motive Power of Fire. With this, with this little book was born the science of thermodynamics. That science reached maturity essentially within one generation, thanks lar largely to the, works, to the work of Kelvin and Clausius. Thermodynamics is the theory of the relation between heat and work, but its origins lie in practical engineering. The early 19th century was the age of the steam engine. 
In a steam engine, combustible fuel is burned in a furnace, water is thereby boiled, and the pressure of the expanding steam is used to drive a piston. A steam engine is an example of a heat engine which expends a certain quantity of heat to produce a certain quantity of usable work. Steam is known as the expansive agent or working substance in a steam engine. Other heat engines use other substances such as air, alcohol, etc. Carnot's reflections begin with a series of questions chiefly of interest to engineers. What is the most efficient means of deriving work from heat? Is there any limit to the motive power of fire? that is, of the ability of heat to do work? Could improvements to the steam engine raise without limit the ratio of work produced to fuel expended? Would a heat engine be more efficient, for example, if it worked with an expansive agent other than water vapor, such as air? Or is there an assignable limit to the motive power of fire, a limit which the nature of things will not allow to be passed by any means whatever? On these seemingly modest practical foundations, Carnot built the theoretical edifice of classical thermodynamics. At first glance, it might seem that a hot body all by itself can always be used to do work. One simply puts the hot body in contact with an expandable vessel filled with a gas such as air or steam and uses the pressure of the expanding gas to drive a piston. Voila, work has been done. But Carnot is the first to see clearly that to derive work from heat, one must have not only a hot body, but also a cold body. To understand his insight, it will be helpful first to say something about the context in which Carnot was thinking and writing about heat engines. At the end of the 18th century, the chief rival to steam power was water power. Consider how a water engine, that is to say a water wheel, derives work from the water flowing down a stream. A water wheel generates motive power by taking in water at a given height and releasing it at a lower height. Work can be derived from water engines only where there is water elevated above the adjacent terrain. As we would say, the potential energy of the elevated water is converted into the mechanical energy of the water wheel. Or as Carnot and his contemporaries would put it, the fall of water is the source of the motive power of the water engine. If all the water on Earth were at sea level, there would be, in effect, a kind of equilibrium and no work could be done by water, age, water engines. Only where there is a lack of equilibrium in the elevation of water, that is, where, wherever water is raised above some of its surroundings, can work be done when the water falls. In reflecting on the steam engine, Carnot noticed what seemed to him an analogous fall of heat. What happens in a steam engine is this. Heat is generated at the furnace at a high temperature. It is then incorporated into the steam, which expands and drives the piston. Then the steam is brought in contact with a cold body or refrigerator, which condenses the steam by cooling it, after which it is again put in contact with the furnace, and the cycle begins all over again. Carnot saw that in every case, work can be produced from heat only if some heat is absorbed from the furnace at a higher temperature and discharged at the refrigerator at a lower temperature. He concluded that just as the fall of water from one height to another is the source of motive power in the water wheel, so too the fall of heat from one temperature to another is the source of power in a steam engine, and hence presumably in any heat engine. Now it may have occurred to some of you that one could operate a steam engine without any refrigerator at all. That is, after boiling the water and using the pressure of the expanding steam to drive the piston, you simply open the piston, expel the steam into the atmosphere, add new water, and begin the boiling process all over again. In fact, the more primitive steam engines of Carnot's time did operate in just this way, using fresh water for each cycle and eliminating the condensation phase. In that case, what becomes of Carnot's fall of heat? Carnot, however, anticipated this objection and answered it by pointing out that in such instances, the atmosphere itself is cooler than the steam and functions as an enormous refrigerator. That is, when the piston is opened, the heated steam goes away only because the surrounding air is cool enough to receive it. Thus, the condensation phase cannot really be eliminated. In harnessing, in harnessing the motive power of heat, one cannot escape the necessary flow of heat from a hot body to a cold body. As Carnot put it, the motive power of a steam engine is due to a reestablishment of the equilibrium of caloric. That is, just as water spontaneously flows downhill 
to restore its mechanical equilibrium, so heat spontaneously flows from a hotter body to a colder body to restore its thermal equilibrium. And just as water engines could do no work if all water were at sea level, no work could be done by steam engines if all bodies were at the same temperature. Just as water never spontaneously flows uphill, heat never spontaneously moves from a colder body to a hotter body. Conversely, wherever there exists a difference of temperature, motive power can be produced by allowing the heat to fall from the hot body to the cold body while driving a heat engine. Carnot took the analogy with water power one step further, however. Just as the water driving a water wheel is not destroyed in passing from one elevation to another, Carnot reasoned that heat is not consumed in passing through a heat engine. It is merely transported from a hot body to a cold body. Carnot found it easier to draw this conclusion because he believed in the conservation of heat. That is, he subscribed to the common view championed by Lavoisier in the previous century that heat is a subtle material fluid, <coughs> usually called caloric, that can be neither created nor destroyed. The very title of Carnot's book, On the Motive Power of Fire, already indicates his belief in the material nature of heat. The fall of heat that produces motive power in a steam engine is thus the flow of caloric from a hot body to a cold body. And since heat or caloric is indestructible, the steam engine does not operate by converting heat into work. In the cycl cyclical operation of the steam engine, the same quantity of heat that is absorbed by the steam at the furnace must also be discharged by the, st by the steam at the refrigerator. By the 1850s, however, it was to become clear that the caloric theory was untenable as an account of the nature of heat, and it began to give way to the rival mechanical theory of heat. According to the mechanical theory, heat is not a subtle material substance, it is a form of motion. Heat is not conserved during the operation of a steam engine. It is consumed in the production of work. Indeed, the quantity of work produced by the consumption of a unit of heat is always the same, a universal constant of nature. Thus, the steam engine produces a certain quantity of work only because a definite quantity of heat is consumed during each cycle. Accordingly, on any one cycle in which work is done, the quantity of heat discharged at the refrigerator must be smaller than the quantity of heat absorbed at the furnace. That is, of the heat absorbed at the furnace, part is converted into work and part is passed to the refrigerator. Note that the old caloric theory and the new mechanical theory of heat are not in disagreement about the conservation of energy. Carnot himself accepted the principle that energy, the capacity to do work, can neither be created nor destroyed. What Carnot denied is that heat is a form of energy. Instead, he considered it an indestructible substance that is capable of doing work when it undergoes a fall in temperature, just as water is capable of doing work when it undergoes a fall of elevation. Overall, Carnot had three brilliant insights that survive to this day, unsullied by his error regarding the nature of heat. The first insight is the fall of heat, which we've already considered. The second insight is the cycle. Carnot saw that in order to understand the motive power of a steam engine, it is not sufficient to look only at the heat generated in the furnace and the work done by the piston. In order to see the relation between heat and work, one must contrive to return the heated and expanded steam to its original condition. That is, the steam must be cooled and compressed so that it is in exactly the same state it was in before it absorbed heat from the furnace. Only if the cycle is completed in this way can we be confident that the work done by the piston is, is the only mechanical effect of the heat absorbed at the furnace. If we do not complete the cycle, but leave the steam in its heated and expanded state, we would have to include the alteration of the state of the steam as an effect of the, of the heat absorbed at the furnace. In short, Carnot saw that a complete cycle must be considered if we are to understand fully the necessary and sufficient conditions for heat to do work. <laughs> Consideration of the complete cycle and the fall of heat led Carnot to his third great insight. He noticed that under certain circumstances, the operations that make up the cycle are reversible. What do we mean by a reversible process? Consider again the water wheel. Under normal operation, the water wheel produces work by taking in water at the upper level and discharging it at the lower level. But the wheel could be operated in reverse, taking in water at the lower level 
and discharging it at the upper level. In that case, of course, we would have to supply the work of turning the wheel and raising the water. In effect, a water wheel operating in reverse is a machine for converting mechanical energy into potential energy, the energy of water raised uh, in the Earth's gravitational field. Note, however, that no actual water wheel can be entirely reversible. If at any point in the operation of a water wheel, any water is allowed to fall some distance without driving the wheel, that part of the operation is irreversible because turning the wheel in reverse would not restore the water to the height that was lost. In a perfect or completely reversible water wheel, the water must not <coughs> be permitted to fall any distance without driving the wheel as it falls. Of course, water wheels fall short of perfect reversibility in other ways as well. Any friction in the operation of the machinery, any turbulence in the flow of the water are processes that it would be impossible to reverse if the water is operated backwards. Carnot noted that heat engines too can be operated in reverse. Under normal operation, a heat engine produces work by taking in heat at the furnace at a higher temperature and discharging heat at the refrigerator at a lower temperature. <coughs> but operated in reverse, a heat engine would absorb heat at the lower temperature and discharge heat at the higher temperature. In effect, a heat engine operating in reverse is a refrigerating machine or a heat pump which extracts heat from a cold body and expels it into a hotter body. Of course, to operate a refrigerating machine, we would have to supply work in order to drive the heat engine in reverse. In a reverse steam engine, for example, we would have to compress the steam mechanically at the higher temperature so, so as to expel its heat to the hotter body or furnace. Carnot saw that not every heat engine can be operated fully in reverse. In particular, if at any stage in the operation of a steam engine, some heat is allowed to fall from a higher temperature to a lower temperature without doing expansive work on the steam, that part of the operation will not be reversible. For example, if the vessel containing the heated steam is not well insulated and loses some of its heat by direct conduction to the cooler air that surrounds it, that part of the cycle will be irreversible because by operating the engine backwards, it would not be possible to recover the heat lost to the environment. A fully reversible steam engine is one in which no heat is ever allowed to flow directly from a hot body to a cold body, or equivalently, one in which the fall of heat is always mediated by the expansive work of the steam. Or as Carnot put it, the condition of perfect reversibility and hence maximum efficiency in a heat engine is that there should occur no changes of temperature which are not due to changes of volume. In practice, all actual working heat engines are irreversible to one degree or another. Nevertheless, Carnot's theory is founded on consideration of the ideal perfectly reversible heat engine. If during one cycle a reversible steam engine absorbs a certain quantity of heat from the furnace and produces a definite amount of expansive work, then by consuming that same amount of work, we can operate the engine in reverse and restore to the furnace the same quantity of heat. That is Carnot's idea of reversibility. Now armed with these three great insights, namely the fall of heat, the cycle, and the idea of reversibility, Carnot stated and proved an astonishingly general theorem regarding the operation of any and all heat engines. This theorem permitted him to answer the questions with which his reflections began about the maximum efficiency possible in a heat engine. As you will recall, engineers of the time wondered whether there was any assignable limit to the amount of work that could be extracted from a given quantity of heat, and whether in particular an expansive agent other than steam might derive work from heat more efficiently. What Carnot proved was, in his own words, that the motive power of heat is independent of the agents employed to realize it. Its quantity is fixed solely by the temperatures of the bodies between which the transport of caloric finally takes place. Therefore, the maximum of motive power resulting from the employment of steam is also the maximum of motive power realizable by any means whatsoever. More precisely, what Carnot shows is that any reversible engine operating between two fixed temperatures produces work at the maximum efficiency possible for those temperatures. That is, no choice of a different working substance could possibly improve on the efficiency of a given reversible engine. His proof is a remarkable simple, remarkably simple reductio ad absurdum, 
And here I'd like you to look at the second page <coughs> of the handout. Suppose we have a working reversible heat engine that after a certain period of operation <coughs> has absorbed a quantity of heat Q at the furnace while producing a quantity of work W. This is process A in the handout. Operated in reverse, our engine will consume a quantity of work W while discharging to the furnace the quantity of heat Q. This is process B. Now imagine that there is a second, more efficient engine that absorbs the same quantity of heat Q at the furnace while yielding a quantity of work W plus delta W greater than the work produced by our first engine. This will be process C. Suppose we now combine the forward operation of our second engine with the backwards operation of our first engine. That would be to combine process B and C. Our second engine absorbs heat Q at the furnace while yielding work W plus W, W plus delta W, that's process C. Our first engine, operated in reverse, will restore all the heat Q to the furnace while consuming only work <coughs> W, process B. So the net result of B plus C is that the quantity of work delta W has been produced without taking any heat from the furnace. Clear? At this point, Carnot took a false step, guided by his belief that heat is indestructible. Since all the heat absorbed at the furnace has been returned to it by the end of our combined operation, Carnot assumed that the refrigerator has also given back all the heat it received. The net effect of the con combined operation was, in his eyes, the creation of work out of nothing. And that is impossible because it amounts to the operation of a perpetual motion machine. But if we do not assume with Carnot that heat is indestructible and instead acknowledge that some of the heat is converted into work, we will have to conclude at the e end of Carnot's combined operation, the work delta W has been produced not out of nothing, but out of heat extracted from the refrigerator. This would not be a perpetual motion machine in the original sense but rather a machine that does work merely, merely by extracting heat from a cold body. Had Carnot remained agnostic on the question of the nature of heat, he could still have proved his theorem base, by basing the reductio on a different ground. Let me explain, and this is the lower part of the handout. Consider again the three processes A, <coughs> a B, and C. Process B, you will recall, is the reverse operation of our first engine consuming work W while discharging heat Q to the furnace. Suppose the engine in this process is run a little longer so that altogether it consumes work W plus delta W while discharging to the furnace a quantity of heat Q plus delta Q. Let us call this prolonged version of process B process D. If we now combine processes D and C, the net result is that no work has been done while a quantity of heat delta Q has been transmitted to the furnace. Now both the caloric and the mechanical theory of heat agree in denying that heat can be produced out of nothing when no work has been done. And therefore on both theories we are forced to conclude that the heat delta Q given to the furnace has been extracted from the refrigerator. So the net result is that heat has been transferred from a cold body to a hot body without any other permanent change taking place. But that is impossible according to Carnot. So our original assumption that engine two is more efficient than the reversible engine one must be false, QED. But notice that Carnot's flawed reductio proof relied on the impossibility of producing work out of nothing. That is on the principle of the conservation of energy which has come to be known as the first law of thermodynamics. In contrast, our modified version of his proof relies on the statement that heat cannot flow spontaneously from a cold body to a hot body. And this latter statement is the form in which Clausius first expressed his entropy principle, which we now call the second law of thermodynamics. 
It is often said that Carnot, with his insight about the fall of heat and his belief that heat was indestructible, discovered the second law of thermodynamics without knowing the first law. But that is quite misleading. As we can see in his rejection of perpetual motion, Carnot embraced the idea of energy conservation. He merely denied that heat is a form of energy. He believed that heat did work by falling down a temperature gradient, much as water does work by falling down a gradient of height. Carnot ruled out a spontaneous passage of heat from a cold body to a hot body on the same ground that he ruled out the spontaneous ascent of water up a hill. Both would be violations of energy conservation, producing work out of nothing. Ironically then, for Carnot, the impossibility of heat flowing from a colder to a hotter body is not an original and independent law, but rather a routine consequence of the law of energy conservation. Because he misunderstood the nature of heat, he was unable to recognize the significance of what he had in fact found, the second law of thermodynamics. The theorem proved by Carnot has important consequences, both theoretical and practical. Practically, it means that a heat engine operating between two fixed temperatures can be made more efficient only by making its operations more perfectly reversible. Changing the working substance, say from steam to air or alcohol, will not raise the maximum rate at which work can be derived from heat. Theoretically, Carnot's theorem means that in a perfectly reversible heat engine, the work produced per unit of heat absorbed depends only on the temperatures of the furnace and the refrigerator. Carnot himself never found the formula expressing that dependence, so he could not write down an expression for the efficiency of a reversible heat engine. That was one of the great tasks that he led, left to his immediate successors, Lord Kelvin and Rudolf Clausius. More importantly, Carnot's work led within a generation to the discovery of entropy and the precise mathematical statement of the second law of thermodynamics. For the rest of the 19th century, despite his embrace of the ill-starred caloric theory, Carnot's idea <coughs> of the perfect heat engine as a reversible cyclic process operating between two temperatures became the indispensable vehicle for all, for all serious progress in thermodynamics. It captured the imagination of all the great scientists who came across Carnot's work, and it led more or less directly to the completion of classical thermodynamics in the 1850s and 60s. Let us see very briefly how things turned out. This is part three, much shorter, about, uh, after Carnot. For a generation after it appeared in 1824, Carnot's book was almost entirely neglected. It was then rediscovered by Kelvin and Clausius around 1850. In the meantime, the investigations of James Joule had undermined the authority of the caloric theory of heat. Kelvin himself, however, still believed in the conservation of heat when he embraced Carnot's ideas in 1848, and it seemed to him highly doubtful that Carnot's treatment of the heat engine could survive if one abandoned the axiom that heat is indestructible. It was Clausius in 1850 who first saw clearly that Carnot's main ideas could be salvaged even if the caloric theory of heat was discarded in favor of the mechanical theory. Clausius showed how one could give up Carnot's assumption that no heat is lost in the operation of the Carnot cycle while modifying Carnot's reductio proof of the, theor of the theorem that a reversible heat engine attains the maximum efficiency possible. Sorry. Carnot's reductio remains essentially valid with the correction that we have just discussed. It will not be possible here to do more than summarize the steps by which Clausius, with help from Kelvin, dis disentangled Carnot's insights from the caloric theory of heat and founded thermodynamics on a rigorous mathematical basis. Clausius showed that heat is indeed interconvertible with work, but only in cyclical processes, with the maximum efficiency being achieved when those processes are reversible. Clausius and Kelvin were able to discover what had eluded Kelvin, what had eluded Carnot, namely the precise mathematical formula for the maximum work that can be obtained from one cycle of an ideal heat engine operating between two fixed temperatures. More, significant, more significantly for the future of modern physics, they established the existence of two properties of all bodies that deserve to be called functions of state because they depend only on the present state of a system and not on the path 
by which the system acquired that state. Carnot's error was essentially to suppose that heat itself was such a function of state. Clausius first showed that not the heat but the internal energy of the gas in a Carnot engine was a property of that kind. In any process, the change in the internal energy is equal to the heat added to the body minus the work done by the body on the external world. In any cyclical process, the change in internal energy is zero. Being a function of state was a necessary, though not sufficient, condition for internal energy to be conserved. Clausius next showed that a second quantity, which he was to name the entropy, was also a function of state. As Clausius discovered, the measure of the entropy added to a body when heat flows into it is simply the quantity of heat divided by the absolute temperature at which the process occurs. It follows at once that when heat flows directly from a hot body to a cold body, the net entropy of the two bodies and of the universe as a whole does not remain constant but increases. The second law of thermodynamics as formulated by Clausius asserts that the, pro the entropy of an isolated system either remains constant for ideal reversible processes or increases for all real processes but never decreases. A direct implication is, is that heat cannot flow spontaneously from a cold body to a hot body, and you will recognize the latter as the principle that we invoked to correct Carnot's flawed reductio proof. Looking backwards, one may see that Clausius' mm -hmm. achievement is in a real sense a vindication of Carnot's insights regarding what goes on in heat engines. Carnot thought of heat at a higher temperature as somehow more energetic more capable of doing work than heat at a lower temperature. Accordingly, to allow heat to pass directly from a hot body to a cold body is simply a waste of available energy uncompensated by useful work. Since the measure of entropy change is heat lost or gained divided by temperature, we can now see that high temperature heat is low entropy heat and vice versa. The uncompensated flow of heat from hot to cold bodies is thus a spontaneous increase of entropy and a permanent loss of some portion of the usable energy in the universe. Not only did Carnot see that a fall of heat is necessary for heat to do work, he also believed that something absorbed from the furnace is passed undiminished to the refrigerator. He thought it was the heat and he was wrong. But it does turn out that in a reversible engine, exactly the same amount of entropy that enters the engine at the furnace also leaves the engine at the refrigerator. Finally, this is the fourth part, nearing the end. It's about the implications of the discovery of entropy. I have already reported some of the gloomy expectations that the second law of thermodynamics has inspired in some authors. In contrast to classical Newtonian mechanics, thermodynamics teaches that for any closed system and for the universe as a whole, the future is essentially different from the past and probably not for the better. Whether such thinking justifies a general mood of despondency or rather a resolute determination to eat, drink, and be merry is a question perhaps best pursued over a glass of Jules Pale Ale to say nothing of New Age Blonde. Instead, and to bring this talk to a timely end, I would like to point out three subtler implications of the discovery of entropy that may prove worthy of discussion. First, there is the interesting circumstance that Carnot's founding of thermodynamics was mixed up with an erroneous belief in the caloric theory of heat. Great as were the achievements of Kelvin and Clausius, I have little doubt that Carnot's insights regarding the fall of heat, the cycle, and reversibility were of far greater significance and originality than the theoretical advances they made possible. Now, it is always interesting when a great insight is entangled with a great error, but in this case, one could even make the case that the insight would have been impossible without the error. That is, that it was only because of the power in Carnot's mind of the analogy with the water wheel that he was able to see what no one had seen before, 
that the production of work by heat could only be understood in terms of a fall of heat in an essentially cyclical process where, a, where maximum efficiency is achieved by permitting no uncompensated fall of heat. And yet, had Carnot been disabused too early of his false view that heat, like water, is a material substance that is preserved while it falls, the analogy with the water wheel could not have made such a powerful and fruitful impression. One wonders, are there other cases in which a serious error has been the indispensable condition for a profound theoretical advance? It seems that Hegel would want to weigh in on this point. Second, there is the perennial question of how much our understanding of the human things and of our place in the whole can be affected by the discoveries of modern science. In this case, the question takes an especially interesting turn. I think there is little doubt that, that the existence and nature of entropy could not have been discovered apart from the modern scientific project. And it is well known that that project at its origin is closely associated with the goal of the mastery of nature for the enlargement of human power. But in this case, we find the peculiar circumstance that a major theoretical advance was achieved and I would argue could only have been achieved by intense reflection on a nitty gritty problem of engineering, specifically how to improve the efficiency of a steam engine. Indeed, the science of thermodynamics was discovered not so much through contemplation of nature, but through study of machinery. The Carnot cycle is, after all, an idealization of the operation of a man-made engine, not of anything that is ever encountered in nature. The discovery of entropy, then, seems to be a case where not only modern science, but even modern technology as such, grimy, sooty, and oil-soaked, has produced key theoretical insights into the nature of the world and our place in it. This seems to me a point worth discussing. And finally, the subtlest and most interesting question concerns the theoretical status of the two laws of thermodynamics themselves. Of course, a perennial topic in the philosophy of science is what it means to call something a law of nature, and whether that grandiose phrase means anything more than a generalization from experience. Interestingly, Albert Einstein, who was typically, typically skeptical of any physical theory's claim to absolute truth, wrote of the deep impression made upon him by classical thermodynamics. Quote, it is the only physical theory of universal content concerning which I am convinced that within the framework of the applicability of its basic concepts, it will never be overthrown. As I mentioned earlier, the conservation of energy, the subject of the first law, seems to most people a more clear and intuitive idea than the increase of entropy, the subject of the second law. The former would appear to rest on the axiom or intuition that a perpetual motion machine is impossible. That is, that work cannot be done without the expenditure of energy. And this is but a more precise expression of the age-old conviction that there can be no science of nature, in fact, there can be no nature at all, unless nothing can come out of nothing. That is a conviction that was shared by all the Greek philosophers from the atomists to the idealists, and perhaps by every scientist since. But what is its basis? The scientific champions of the first law were inclined to invoke theological considerations. Joule, for example, declared that the grand agents of nature are by cr the creator's fiat indestructible, and wherever mechanical force is expended, an exact equivalent of heat is always obtained. And Kelvin tells us that he is certain that creative power alone can either call into existence or annihilate mechanical energy. Meanwhile, in the book of Exodus, when God wanted to attract the attention of Moses, he set in his path a bush that burned with fire but was not consumed. Only when Moses turned aside to see for himself why the bush burned but did not burn up, did God reveal his plan for the liberation of the children of Israel from slavery. Evidently, the qualities God was looking for in the leader of the Jewish people were scientific curiosity plus an intuitive grasp of the first law of thermodynamics. And yet, an intuition is not a proof, and the ultimate ground for our belief in the conservation of energy remains enigmatic. Perhaps the only significant advance on this question was made in 1915 by Emmy Noether, 
the greatest woman mathematician in history. What she proved was that every conservation law is the consequence of a particular symmetry that is found in nature. The conservation of energy in particular is associated with symmetry or invariance of a, cer <coughs> of a certain dynamical function called the Lagrangian with respect to translation in time. Of course, Nurture's theorem only shifts the question of the ground of energy conservation to the equally perplexing question, why are there such symmetries in nature? As for the second law of thermodynamics, it appears to rest on the intuition or axiom that heat cannot spontaneously flow from a cold body to a hot body. That is, that it can be made to flow in that direction only if work is done on a system. I leave it to you to judge whether this rule is anything more than, an, than a generalization from experience. However, only a few years after Clausius <coughs> coined the term entropy in 1865, the Austrian physicist Ludwig von Boltzmann began a program of research on the random molecular motions that underlie the large-scale phenomena studied by thermodynamics. What Boltzmann created was the science of statistical mechanics, one of whose principal results is a new and deeper understanding of the entropy law. According to Boltzmann, every macroscopic state of a body, for example, a volume of gas at a given temperature, has available to it a multitude of possible microstates. In our example, the innumerable ways the mechanical energy can be distributed among the molecules of a gas in that state. Boltzmann showed that the entropy of a system is a function of the number of microstates available to a given macrostate. And as all microstates are presumed to be equally probable, the Boltzmann entropy turns out to be a function of the relative probability of the given macrostate. Translated into statistical mechanics, the second law of thermodynamics expresses the fact that over time, systems composed of many particles in random motion tend to evolve from less probable states to more probable states and not vice versa. Sometimes the second law is informally said to involve a tendency toward greater disorder, but that is only because ordered states are for the most part highly improbable. Heat tends to flow from a hot body to a cold body simply because a collection of particles in random motion, yet with all the hotter or faster moving particles in one place and all the colder or slower ones in another, is highly unlikely to arise by chance, whereas a more or less uniform mixture of faster and slower molecules is much more likely. In the same way, a box of coins <clears throat> all facing heads up is likely when shaken to become a box with about half the coins facing down. Further shaking is unlikely to reproduce the original improbable configura configuration with all coins heads up. If you find this intelligible, you, has, you have grasped the essence of the second law of thermodynamics as reinterpreted by Boltzmann. Hence my suggestion that contrary to initial appearances, it is the first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy, that is ultimately mysterious as to its ground, whereas the second law, the increase of entropy, at least as clarified by Boltzmann, is the epitome of logic and common sense. Of course, the evolution of physical systems toward higher states, toward states of higher and higher entropy, depends on the fact that underlying phenomena such as heat, there is an uncountable multitude of microscopic particles, each moving independently of the others, the whole ensemble governed entirely by chance. Thankfully, there are local pockets of the universe in which chance does not entirely rule, and tempor temporarily at least, entropy may even decrease. Finding and expanding those pockets is no doubt for human beings a large part of the pursuit of happiness. And now, lest I be accused of giving a talk with little or no relevance to political theory, let alone constitutional government, let me close with a passage from the Thomas Pynchon short story, Entropy, whose main character in his youth read a little too much thermodynamics and is now tempted at age 54 to drift into the graceful decadence of an enervated fatalism. Quote, his had always been a vigorous Italian sort of pessimism, 
Like Machiavelli, he allowed the forces of Virtu and Fortuna to be about 50-50. But the equations now introduced a random factor which pushed the odds to some unutterable and indeterminate ratio which he found himself afraid to calculate. Thank you. Questions? What can we say? Um, but thank you. That was very, uh, very clear and very interesting. And I'm afraid I'm even more ignorant on these issues than you probably expect us all to be. But, but um, one, one question. I mean, you seemed like you were pretty confident that the second law of thermodynamics is not likely to be overturned uh, anytime soon. But I just wonder. I mean, so it's supposed to be in a closed system meaning also the universe as a whole, but, but in what sense can the universe be known to be a closed system? I mean, especially from the very little like all of recent physics, there are these things that, well, you know, maybe 97% maybe of the energy in the universe is dark energy or dark matter or something, or maybe 90%, and these are only the, you know, the uh, known unknowns, and then there might be all sorts of unknown unknowns, and, um, I mean, is that, I don't know, that might not be of any relevance, but I just don't, don't really understand thinking of the universe as a closed system and thinking that that's a firm, a firm way to think about it. I mean, the universe is closed, if you mean by the universe, everything, so there's nothing outside it. It's by definition closed. But if you mean that there might be as yet undiscovered parts of the universe that are sources of energy and um, uh, regions, low entropy regions of the universe that would delay or um, um, put off indefinitely the heat death of the universe. Those are possibilities. But I, would, I wouldn't say that they bear on the question of whether the universe is closed. Mm -hmm. They just mean that parts of the universe are not fully characterized. Mm -hmm. But if you mean that there might be a source of energy outside of the universe, and then you'd have to say, does it come into existence, and if so, why? Well, I mean, it's just that way of speaking about it seems like it implies we have a, a better handle on things than, than uh, some recent developments suggest to me, but I, I mean, I don't know, I don't know about the details, but... Um, I'm I, I mean, again, it's, the second law in no way says that regions of the world can't um, for a long, long time witness a, a decrease of entropy because uh, work is being done on them or energy is pouring into high temperature heat. We, we, our life is parasitic on the sun's energy. And uh, so maybe that doesn't entirely address your question. But I, I think the principle that Given a closed system, entropy can only increase. I think Einstein was right that that can never be um, opposed. And I think it became clear to him only after Boltzmann that that was true, that when, it, when it's associated with probability, it just becomes obvious, doesn't it? And, and by the way, once associated with probability, the entropy law becomes... Um, a description of what's overwhelmingly likely to happen, not what will necessarily happen. You understand that? That it's not out of the question to shake up a box of coins and f open it up and find that they're all facing heads up. It's just not likely. But that would not violate any law if you did find that. Please. I, a quick question following on that. It would seem that human life then would by analogy be almost entirely consisting of that improbable but not impossible shaking up coins resulting in no side up side down changes and I think even a very active you know, procreation in which the sperm the percentage of chance of, of any specific sperm is so slight it just seems in a way um, I just think of the explanatory power of the analogy of that for human life that the complexity of, of not only living human beings, but all living beings, all animals, is so incredible 
that it almost seems as if, if we think it, that it's not uh, if that biolog that biology is is, a, is affected or is, is governed by entropy as well that one would be in position of this. I wonder if one is pushed into this position of saying that almost all bi biological life is a, is a case of this almost in, almost miraculous but technically speaking um, highly improbable state or is that or is that not track? I don't know if I. Well, what you're saying is not quite right because, um, I mean, what I probably could have s spent more time on is the fact that classical thermodynamics consists of systems <coughs> close to equilibrium. And um, if you're pumping an enormous amount of energy into a system, you can drive it very far from equilibrium. And there are developments in thermodynamics which show perfectly clearly that under those circumstances entropy decreases um, order can spontaneously be created out of disorder that is life life is not miraculously unlikely to happen under conditions of pumping energy and keeping a system very far from equilibrium so it's not um, it's not that if you look around us, you say this is a, as miraculous as a box of coins um, all ending up heads up. Does that make sense? It's maybe unpredictable what will happen under those circumstances, but it's not entirely unlikely that order will be created and uh, complexity will develop and things will get less simple rather than more simple. Can I ask a, a, a sure. question? Um, and it, this, again, I think it's my difficulty conceptually um, understanding these matters. If entropy exists, I mean, why wouldn't, I mean, it, does it presuppose any specific cosmogony? I mean, does, is entropy as a theory uh, presuppose the infinity of, the, of the, the uncreatedness of the universe? Or is it neutral regarding its structure? Uh, why wouldn't, uh, in, a, in an infinite, an eternal universe we already have reached that that seems I guess at the, at the back of my mind I kind of think of the, th the theory of eternal recurrence of the same that there's this and you could say the Big Bang but then you need the cause of the Big Bang and so you, you're faced with this problem of uh, so-called unilinear development <coughs> entropy is related to unilinear development even like Leibniz said it just seems I want I just I, I don't know how to I'm sorry I don't know how to articulate it better than this but is it is it is that related to, or is that is is that hinge upon an account of cosmogony, or is that, or the eternity of the universe going both ways, or is it well, potentially? I, neutral? I would separate the question of why there is entropy, or what entropy is, or what, how we know it exists, from these cosm cosmogonic questions you're raising about why, how did it all begin, how long ago, why are we where we are, why, why hasn't it already? Um, become uh, 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 completely, why hasn't this progress completely finished already? I, those are questions I don't think the thermodynamics that I'm presenting really says much about. It's certainly an interesting question why, uh, you know, Kelvin in that initial quote from 1852 talks about the past as well as the future, and one can't help thinking on thermodynamic grounds, not a, just about the ultimate heat de death of the universe, but um, what things must have been like long ago so that we have the mu as much um, order as we have now. But it seems to me the existence of entropy is not a mystery. It's not, it's as easy to grasp as, as it seems to me it can be grasped by laying some coins out on the table and flipping them and convincing yourself that uh, Certain outcomes are just inherently more likely than others. That's all it is. And coupled with the fact that maybe this is the key thing, that the objects that we care about are at least in some respects made up of a countless multitude of atoms and molecules that are all jiggling around independently of, of each other and that are governed by the laws of chance. If that were not the case, if things were, uh, you know, hard, solid blocks of crystalline matter, then um, these laws of thermodynamics would have much less sway. So that, that I think, is a, a 
key factor in the existence of entropy. Please. Um, you seem to suggest that both of the laws of thermodynamics <coughs> are, they presuppose the belief that it's impossible for something to come from nothing, um, and a specifically work or motion. Um, but isn't that precisely the thing that it's incumbent on science to prove rather than presuppose uh, the principle of sufficient reason? And as long as it simply believes that, um, it's vulnerable to the claim that it isn't science, or it's not better off than someone who doesn't believe in it. The person is creative. Yeah. Maybe, well, maybe that puts better more. Like. It's a difficulty. I wouldn't say it's incumbent on anyone to prove something that can't be proved, but it's a difficulty, and it exposes science to the consideration that it is not necessarily built on uh, certainty. So it requires a kind of modesty about origins, but I don't think it, um, it necessarily involves criticism of science. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess the only... I mean, do you think it could be proved in any other way that nothing can come out of nothing? Well, I'm not sure how it could be proved, but it seems like in the, in, insofar as we lack a proof, such a proof, whatever that may be, then the kind of things that I guess from what you read of Bertrand Russell that he ruled out, um, the, uh, so a theological view of the world would gain actually uh, in that light. That it would become more plausible. So if science self-consciously rests on why more plausible? I could see why more desirable. Well, well, no, I would say more plausible also because if science self-consciously rests on a belief or something that it says it can't prove, then the the position of belief could say, um, well, we're akin in both believing. You haven't proven anything. And science would have to say, yes, and by, therefore, by my own standard, proof, demonstration, I fall short. Whereas the position of belief could still say, um, by my standard, I'm consistent. So I guess I would agree that theological belief would become more plausible in, than, than it would have been under the prior dogmatic assumption that scientists had a refutation. But in and of itself, I don't <coughs> think it gains plausibility. So, or, I mean, no, no one religious text, therefore, seems more worth reading than before. <laughs> Please. Um, I'm thinking about optimism and pe pessimism. And I find myself wondering if it is really right to characterize the implications of, uh, for example, Leibniz's view as optimistic or uh, Russell's view as pessimistic. Uh, sure. They certainly thought so, but they may not have been right. Um, I mean, I find myself thinking, well, perhaps thermodynamics or the discovery of entropy is pessimistic if Doing work is what is primarily important to a person. This is a view for, for engineers, actually. Um, if, if we are valorizing doing work, uh, then, then it is, in a sense, sad that our capacity to do work will eventually end. But uh, should we valorize doing work? I think about the Aristotelian prime mover, uh, for whom it seems that lack of need to do work on the sublunary bodies is one of the conditions of uh, the prime mover's happiness. Uh, perhaps it's better not to have to do work, or perhaps it's consoling that uh, we live in a universe where the need to do work will eventually end. It's, it's kind of an unusual view, but I wonder if you think it's a, a tenable view, or uh, could we look at the inevitability of entropy as a good thing? Well, I think that's where the modern word vacation got its... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I mean, it doesn't seem to me that it's required to think of, about humans doing work to say that the implications of the... Yeah, it's true that, that uh, the heat of the, uni of the universe as presented by Kelvin has to do with uh, mechanical work being... the ability to do it, mechanical work being lost. So it makes it sound like we won't be able to get anything done. But it also means that we'll all be at room temperature and we'll all be dead. And so 
it, you know, that universe doesn't end in quiet contemplation. <laughs> it, uh, it ends in nothing or in rest, eternal rest. So maybe if that's what we're, if work is so bad that eternal rest looks good, then I would say, yes, thermodynamics is not pessimistic. Does that make sense? In other words, yes, it's being put in terms of work, and that might sound kind of Marxist, or, or at any rate, it might imply a view that the essence of human life is labor, but I, I don't think that's re required to... Uh, maybe that's not what you were implying. I don't think that's required to view um, thermodynamics as pessimistic and Leibniz as optimistic. I'm a little bit still unsure of what entropy is. I wonder if you could explain. I was I'm surprised to find that, that it's so tied with engines and refrigeration. And it's the, I was wondering if you could explain what it is to somebody who lived in an age prior to engines. <laughs> if somebody before Jane Austen <laughs> even came back. And, and I ask you to explain what it is to them in their terms. How would you answer that? Yeah, so I mean, you could give at least two different answers, and you really could give several, or maybe you could give three interesting answers. But the first one, the thermodynamic one, has to do with hot and cold bodies and the ability to get work out of them. And uh, entropy in that context is a measure of the degree to which the heat in a body is available to do work. And so high temperature heat is low entropy heat and is very available. And low temperature heat is, uh, such as you'd find in the ocean, is uh, high entropy heat and not very available. So just as a practical matter, that as I s said, what Clausius figured out, and this was a really great achievement, was that when heat flows out of a body at a temperature T and the heat lost is heat is Q, then the, um, the entropy that flows out is Q divided by T. And that immediately shows you that um, you know, you're better off with very, very high temperature because then only a little bit of entropy is flowing out. And um, uh, low temperature means <coughs> a lot of <coughs> entropy is flowing out. So um, that's one simple answer. What the Boltzmann and statistical mechanics showed is that under the underlying molecular level, thermodynamics is a theory at the phenomenal level that takes things that we feel and see around us. <coughs> you know, that the body has a certain volume, it exerts a certain pressure, it um, has a degree of hotness. Statistical mechanics looks at the molecular level, at all the motions going on, at the distribution of energy among the p particles, and reinterprets entropy as a function. You know, it's actually a logarithmic function. I, I uh, chose not to put a logarithm on this uh, <laughs> sheet because it didn't want to make you even more depressed. But uh, uh, it's the Boltzmann who committed suicide, has on his gravestone <laughs> S equals K log W. Uh, it was his, that's the statement of his, what he must have considered his greatest uh, achievement. S entropy is a constant K times the logarithm of W, uh, Wahrscheinlichkeit, uh, probability. So that the, the entropy is the logarithm of the probability of a state. That's the, that's the statistical mechanic. Um, statement of what entropy is. And, um, you know, and then the last development in the middle of the 20th century, Americans uh, discovered a connection between entropy and information. Uh, actually, down the road at MIT, this is where this was done by a man named Claude Shannon. And uh, so the theory <coughs> of the connection between entropy and information and computation is a very interesting one. And so you can give a, yet a third interesting definition of entropy and it's kind of the absence of information. But I, I, I guess uh, 
I've, I've hidden, in that sense, the puzzling character of entropy because there are many different definitions of it, many entropies for many contexts, and it's not a straightforward matter to show their connections with each other. Does that help? It's true. You don't hold entropy in your hand the way you can but hold a beer. That, it's not just that you can't hold it in your hand, but you can't explain what it is to somebody who, without an equation, without... In, in layman's terms, can it be explained in layman's terms without reference? I mean, even the notion of, of, of work, getting work out of the flow of heat is something that it's not related in any way to common sense. That's not the way, you know, you yeah, that was partly my or. partly my point that you just that progress in this field was made by studying these machines that we normally are not thinking about, and you don't you wouldn't encounter on a walk in the park. You have to go down to the you know to the warehouses and machine shops and study water wheels and care about care about those things. So how would you say? the concept of a totalitarian state, how can we apply entropy to the concept of a totalitarian state? Do, which, do you think that's a reversal of entropy, what a totalitarian state is trying to do? <laughs> um, that's a good one. I'm not sure that there's an easy application Say a little more because about how it looks to you. The totalitarian state is trying to impose an order. It's trying to create some rigid forms <laughs> derived from certain principles. So that's, a, in terms of entropy, that would seem to be a decrease in entropy, going against the grind, the natural course. I mean, what occurs to me is that totalitarianism tries to make all the individual, um, what do you call them, political particles move in an orderly way rather than in a random way and therefore to uh, remove the statistical considerations. I don't, know. I don't really have anything interesting to say on this subject. I, I do confess that this talk uh, it has relatively little to say to political science department. <laughs> and, and Amy Fain, I still, I think I still have absolutely zero idea of, um, it was a good talk, Adam, I'm sorry, but I still have zero idea what's going on. Because, <clears throat> um, so probability, and you were, t you were mentioning the laws of chance, with, which to me is something that is so mind-boggling that I, I don't know what it means, the laws of chance, and then um, probability, or the, the laws of probability, which I suppose are somehow, and the laws of chance are the same thing, or randomness. But you mentioned the box of dice, which is the most, um, I think, the most layman example that, that you could get. And then you said, well, it's not impossible that if you shake them a little more, they all back on the other side, it wouldn't violate any law. But what, I don't understand, how am I supposed to think about these things? And because I can't, in my little brain, I can't, I don't know how to grasp probability or how to even start representing this. Because it, you seem to be saying on the one hand, there are laws of thermodynamics and it means that entropy is increasing, but it wouldn't be against the law of probability that it actually wasn't increasing. And that's kind of bizarre, because if you do shake the box, it could all end up right. in order to get, I don't know what to do with that. I'm completely, I don't know, stunted. Yeah, so there's a whole subject in the field of statistical mechanics in which Boltzmann was fighting off the criticism of people who believed in something like Nietzsche's eternal recurrence of the same that there were theorems to show that in a, a mechanical system, no matter how large and complex, if you wait long enough, any uh, configuration of the uh, constituent particles will recur. And how can that be if the second law of thermodynamics 
suggest that the future. Pardon me? throw of dice, that's how you explain that a certain order can actually come about, but that means it will always continually happen, so it can always recur again. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, there was a very dis interesting uh, theoretical controversy over this uh, at the end of the 19th century between Poincaré and Zermelo and, um, and Boltzmann, and it seems to me Boltzmann always had adequate answers, although he never convinced them and he ultimately killed himself. I think partly because he was bipolar, but partly because he, uh, he was so frustrated on this question. But um, on, what on the question of whether the eternal recurrence of the same means <coughs> that there can't be an overall increase of entropy because, uh, the, and the future can't be essentially different from the past because the, the look around you, this, the way things are organized right now, will, if you wait long enough, be organized this way again. So if, the, if the, at some point in the future is exactly like the present, uh, then th there's no arrow of time, there's no direction, there's no... Or a closed universe would mean, I don't know, I don't know what I'm talking about, but some kind of time-space closure, and then th there starts a new closed universe, and you can only ever look at that by definition, and that has some kind of linearity, but that's well, not... I don't know about that, but I, I do think Mere reflections on things like coin flips are, are very useful in this regard to restore a certain amount of common sense because it's, it's just the case that if you, if you start flipping coins, um, you can... Pascal discovered this in the middle of the 17th century. The so-called Pascal Triangle is what tells you very precisely what the likelihood, if you flip a coin a hundred times, what the likelihood of getting it to be all heads, what the likelihood of getting 10 heads and 90 tails, the likelihood of 50 heads and 50 tails, and you can show very clearly that around 50 heads and 50 tails is the most likely, and uh, one head, or all heads, is very unlikely, but not impossible, and that if you wait long enough, if you do this long enough, you'll, and you keep betting on getting 100 heads, you'll eventually win. But... Uh, and again, what does that say about entropy? Pardon me? Again, what does that say about entropy? Entropy just says speed? that it's likely, if you started with 100 coins on the table all facing heads up, that's a very improbable arrangement to arise by chance. Um, it's a low entropy arrangement. And if you start flipping them, chances are very good that it will move in one direction only, in the direction toward roughly 50-50 distribution, and it's very, very unlikely but not impossible to move back in the direction of all heads or all tails, but not impossible. You'd have to have an awful long time, though, and for practical pur purposes, it's completely irrelevant that that possibility arises. Um, well, I was thinking of the beginning of Stoppard's play, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. <laughs> exactly. begins with coin flipping. So, um, well, uh, the, the idea of entropy presupposes that, what, what, would one say, the primacy of disorder? Yes. Um, In the sense of this random yeah. motion of molecules. Uh -huh. Well, what about our s sense of the orderliness of life? And, uh, the sun comes up in the morning, goes down at night, seasons things like that, that, that uh, orderliness doesn't seem to be so unusual, but disorderly. And don't, don't you have to uh, understand order in order to know what disorder is? Uh, that well, I, might be another way in, in one, which order is primary. In one parenthetical remark, I pointed out that I, I do think that the the standard way of talking about entropy, and the one that I, even I have adopted in this conversation as involving a, a motion from order to disorder, is really not quite correct. In other words, it's not really the case that high entropy always means much disorder. I mean, in some ways, um, you know, if you start out with a large mass of water all churned up, all different al altitudes, and you ended up with uh, a nice, calm, b 
perfectly mirrored surface uh, on a, in a pond, which would you say is the orderly state and which is the disorderly state? Um, it's really not the case that entropy is essentially a motion from disorder to order, but as I've said, from an improbable state to a probable one. And that is defined very specifically by Boltzmann to mean a state uh, that has many, many microstates available to it to express the same state. And um, I don't know, that doesn't entirely answer your question. So it does seem to me that probability can certainly be understood without improbability. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so I would prefer to put it on that on that basis and say that's, a, any that's one. So st statisticians never say improbable. They only say less probable or right. Just as they never say something is important, it's only either trivial or non-trivial. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes, we haven't exhausted the subject, but all right. I'm just very curious, uh, briefly, because you've written on quantum mechanics, and I've heard the story of going from caloric to mechanical, and it counts of heat, or motion counts of heat before. Were there big, any, any big implications in how, uh, as we got a greater sense of quantum dynamics at a submolecular level, whether notions of probabilistic landscapes and thermodynamics, was those just kind of discontinuous and not very interesting for one another, or is this, are there implications of entropy thermodynamics for quantum level analysis? And, uh... I, my, I've never really studied the intersection of thermodynamics and quantum mechanics. My impression is it doesn't change that much. That is, the, for practical purposes, the st statistical character <coughs> of reality is already captured by classical Boltzmann and Maxwell me mechanics and that <coughs> the fact that there's even more randomness and indeterminism at the molecular level than even uh, Boltzmann thought doesn't uh, essentially add to, uh, to the picture at the higher level. That's not to say that quantum mechanics isn't interesting theoretically and I, I think ultimately is far deeper and more interesting, and more amazing in its implications than, than any of the stuff that I've talked about today. But. Well, this has been great. Uh, all right, Adam, let's take the optimistic view and say that uh, this uh, was a very eye-opening. Well, we, we have five more for, minutes, and Adam um, himself had suggested that there was something that he found interesting, and that was how um, you could um, come up with such a fruitful understanding of of the world based on um, a, a completely false understanding of the nature of heat. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, don't, I know very little about that, but yeah, what, what does that say about, um, about the nature of, of our scientific understanding to begin with? If, if you just have a partial, uh, how much is that partial knowledge if it's based on something flawed, um, really flawed or how, I, I don't understand how to understand that kind of yeah the, the, how to understand that insight when it's based on something that seems to be um, wrong or fundamentally wrong or on an analogy that isn't correct with water yeah I just it seemed to me <coughs> to make the Carnot story that much more interesting because here's Carnot not a great mathematician uh, a very a young man, he was in his mid-twenties when he did this work. He was dead by the age of 32. The work went nowhere. Um, did he kill himself? Too? No, he, he uh, was ill. But uh, he died of <coughs> cholera, I believe. But he, he uh, so he wasn't the greatest scientist of his age in some respects. Uh, in, other, in many ways, those who followed him were much more competent mathematicians and much better at recognizing the flaws in the caloric theory of heat. And yet he had this, this genius of imagination of, you know, to grasp the essential features of the science that uh, you, it's hard to account for other than by the sort of uh, the power of, of this sort of analogy in his mind. 
And it's certainly, I don't know if it, if it really has any implications beyond this particular case, but it, it certainly strikes, that plus the, the fact that he had to be an engineer to discover it strikes me as very worth thinking about as regards uh, you know, what it means to gain theoretical insight into nature. That on the one hand, you need to make mistakes <laughs> and be carried away by false images. And on the other hand, you need to um, care about questions like, uh, how do I get this damn engine to crank out more work? Which you would not have thought is a theoretical question. Um, those two uh, aspects of the entropy discovery are actually linked in modern scientific methods. So that <coughs> even in Descartes, you have an account, it seems to me, of deliberate self-conscious falsification or simplification of the variable phenomena into, say, or assume orderliness between various parts, even where there may not be, and, and the method proceeds from that self-consciously knowing that that is, a, if not an erroneous assumption, at least a simplification, or break things into, into, into parts as much as you can. It seems if you both break things into parts and assume orderly relation where there, where there may even not be as, as a beginning step in your method, it seems like in that case, um, you, I don't know if I would call it quite the same error as say the Aztecs assuming a theological dimension to the stars and learning about astronomy. It seems that in a way Descartes or modern science puts the false assumptions or, or axiomatic assumptions which can't be proven or sort of the metaphysical neutrality of the, of the enterprise at the beginning self-consciously. Um, and I, I don't know if you can connect that to, me to mechanics or to, to, to machine technology or not. I know that, again, in Descartes you have this attempt to argue on the basis of humans being machines. That's one of the basic um, tropes that he uses. Um, and it, it might again seem that Machines um, are knowable in a way that nature is not because they are constructed by us. So whether they're real machines, like a real steam engine, or whether they're the ideal reversible engine, in both cases, all the composite parts are built by us and so are part of the method. And I, I don't know if, if that, that seems really interesting. Is. I mean, on the emphasis on machines, I can see that Descartes and his followers would be vindicated by Carnot. In the other way, though, I would say, in a sense, Carnot proves that, at least in this area, there is no scientific method. There is no methodical way of going from ignorance to knowledge. There's no, he didn't just break the problem down into its simplest parts. He, he had in his mind a comprehensive vision of what was going on that was false. And carried away by that vision, he followed it out to its logical conclusions and saw some some things and so it seems almost as though you need a comprehensive imaginative gestalt rather than a methodical breaking down of a problem into its pieces and so in a way there I would draw anti-Cartesian lessons from this example. I mean, I, mean and then I agree that might be right but on the other hand I'm trying to figure out I mean is hypothesis testing fundamentally different than than call than Instead of say, is there is the is it, is for you the, the, the difference in scientific discovery that Carnot full, full believed these things? Because many scientists operate in labs, they have a hypothesis. The whole lab knows it's a hypothesis, and there's a lab across the street with another hypothesis. Nevertheless, all of the work is predicated on the effect on the idea that it, that, that assumes the hypothesis is correct and to test it. And it, I mean, I just wonder whether the I mean, I'm just trying to I don't know how to pull this out whether the Error at the beginning of, or error being fundamental to scientific discovery, can itself be, be made into a method, where we assume, we make assumptions, and then we move forward, and then we can disprove them. Whether there's a self, so-called self-conscious, form of, of uh, or whether, maybe that's wrong in here. Yeah, I, I just don't recognize Descartes as in this, story. Just perhaps to support you. If you look at Tom Kuhn on Copernicus, and all the assumptions of Copernicus are, or what shall I say, uh, uh, rejectable by us, full of uh, erroneous assumptions, but he says, you know, I mean, the sun must be more regal, therefore, uh, 
And so you have a set of assumptions that produces a worldview that he himself cannot prove by, you know, it's really Galileo, an observation of that sort, that will prove it to be correct. So uh, I, I just would offer up Copernicus as a second moment in there, and I suppose if I worked harder, I might find some more uh, illustrations. I, I feel that what you're saying is when we have a model that we can work with consistently, we may come up with something so that it's more important in a way to learn how to model in order to find a truth than it is to uh, empirically bounce around and think something will come of it. Uh, it's, it's the... Better to act. have a whole that is false in some ways exactly. than just pieces. Exactly, and then one could hope to correct it uh, in, as step number two, uh, mm -hmm. take away part of what you said. Yeah, no, whether, you know, it's notoriously difficult to make generalizations about how any great genius in science discovered his own, his theory, and uh, this is just an interesting case study, but it certainly bears out what you're suggesting. Thank you. Well, thank you.